Good evening. I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin. And uh, tonight I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our American Academy lecture with Ian Baruma, currently a writer in residence uh, here at the Academy. His talk, taken from his just published book, is entitled The Collaborators Three Stories of Deception and Survival in Times of War. Now, as uh, some of you may be wondering, when did we uh, create this new designation, this new category here at the Academy of Writer-in-Residence? Ian, um, although I think chronologically was the first person to um, be offered to be a writer-in-residence, although he was, he's the second one to actually get here after Fred Kaplan, the prolific foreign policy commentator uh, who was here earlier in the semester. Uh, and well, you might ask, because we have writers in abundance uh, at the Academy, including uh, this, particularly, this particular semester, three star fiction writers, and I mean that is three star fiction writers, not three star fiction writers, <laughs> for those of you who spend too much time on TripAdvisor. We have three of them in residence, so you may wonder why we are adding more to this category or this new category. And I guess the reason we decided uh, to do so, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, is because it was irresistible. Um, when I heard that Ian, um, someone I have been reading for decades, was interested in spending some time at the Academy, I heard that from a mutual friend, I couldn't say no. We're, um, and we're hearing from an outstanding uh, array of uh, writers uh, that they would like to spend some time, uh, perhaps not, not a whole fellowship here, and so we've created this new category of visitor. Um, of course, we're still figuring out how to fund this new category of visitors, so if any of you tonight are feeling especially flush uh, and want to support this new category, um, uh, why don't you see me right after, and uh, therein ends tonight's commercial appeal. Uh, okay, to tonight's speaker. Uh, I first began reading Ian when I was uh, a graduate student, um, uh, and the dinosaurs were roaming the earth, and I thought I had no time for recreational reading, but still found time uh, to read his pieces, uh, either in the British magazine The Spectator or the Far Eastern Economic uh, Review. He was a fresh, curious, and extraordinarily intelligent voice. Uh, born and raised in The Hague, educated at Leiden. Um, he was writing in those days primarily about Asia and, uh, above all, Japan and China. And he did so in a culturally informed uh, uh, way that was uh, really um, unique. And eventually he began writing about Europe, too, and post-war Germany has in particular been a subject that he has come back to time and again. Um, and I could spend a lot of time reading Ian because he was enormously productive. Am I correct? More than 20 books? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I stand confirmed. Uh, as well as innumerable articles in the New York Review of Books, New York Times, New Yorker, Guardian, uh, Times Literary Supplement, uh, among others. He is also a regular columnist for Project Syndicate. Uh, among uh, his books, I, I still think the best title of all goes to the first one, Behind the Mask, on sexual demons, sacred mothers, transvestites, gangsters, drifters, and other Japanese cultural heroes. Um, but the others were good too, The Wages of Guilt, Memories of War in Germany and in Japan, Occidentalism, The West in the Eyes of Its Enemies, which he co-wrote uh, with the distinguished Israeli political scientist Avishai Margalit, and Year Zero, A History of 1945. There are many others. Um, I have to confess that uh, despite having read so much of Ian, I didn't, we didn't actually uh, connect personally until quite recently, uh, but I could say we did meet cute in a literary sense. Uh, he blurbed a book I co-wrote uh, that came out in 2002, for which I'm still grateful, and I blurbed one of his in 2006, and it's one of my personal favorites, Murder in Amsterdam, uh, The Death of Theo van Gogh and the Limits of Tolerance, which I highly recommend. Ian Baruma is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a recipient of the Erasmus Prize, which is one of Europe's uh, foremost honors, uh, intellectual honors, as well as the LA Times Book Prize uh, and, and, and many others. He has held fellowships at St. Anthony's College at Oxford, 
uh, the Woodrow Wilson Institute. He was uh, down the road a piece at the Wissenschaftskolleg, and he has been at the Remark Institute as well in New York. And when he is not writing, he is the Paul W. Williams Professor of Human Rights and Journalism at Bard College in New York. So the book he will discuss tonight is Baruma at his best, since The Collaborators, which was just published in March, um, has Ian working on, on uh, both sides of the world and uh, uh, comparing and contrasting in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, there are three individuals under consideration, a Manchurian princess, Heinrich Himmler's masseur, and a Jewish fraudster in Nazi-occupied Holland, all were, to use a great German word, Hochstapler, con artists. And in the book, Ian probes their behavior and their culpability in a time of tremendous turmoil and danger. Uh, the book is not only fascinating as an exercise in moral reasoning, but also in its evocation of three contemporary worlds, the Nazi elite, the intersection of Japanese imperialism and, and the Chinese society it sought to put, subjugate, and third, the scene between ever more isolated Jews in Hitler's Europe who were terrified of deportation and the SS officers who were working to send them eastward while depriving them of all their wealth. It's a terrific book, as we've come to expect, and I hope uh, tonight's discussion will prompt you to uh, buy it and read it. Um, I should also say that it is uh, a, one of those great pieces of work that talks about a historical period while talking about the present, and uh, in a period when fraudulence uh, seems to be uh, galloping ahead of us all, um, this is a fascinating work to read. So before I give the floor to Ian, let me just say a few words about the format. He will talk for about 30 minutes. We will have a short discussion and then audience Q&A, and if you are with us at the Academy, please raise your hand to ask questions with question marks. And if you are joining us via Zoom, please type your question in the Q&A part of the platform uh, and not the chat. So with that, Ian, the room is yours. Well, first of all, let me thank you very much for um, letting me be here, which is, uh, um, I cannot thank you enough. Um, also, it was a wonderful introduction, and like all great introductions, it, of course, it took a lot of wind out of my sails because you said all kinds of stuff that I was planning to say, but it's probably said it better. Um, as you already pointed out, um, a German title, and I hope the book will appear in German at some point, um, uh, could easily be Die Hochstapler, because it is about Hochstapler, about self-invented characters. Uh, mythomaniacs and so on, as much as it is about collaborators. And the idea behind that is that in periods of dictatorship and occupation, um, the truth goes out the window. I mean, the cliche, of course, is that the first casualty of war is, is, is the truth. But that's true in dictatorships and, and occupation as well. Everything becomes fake. Even the resistors have to have fake names and so on. And that's those are great times for self-invented characters, for chances who suddenly um, can remake themselves and, and the myths around themselves. Um, and uh, we know how dangerous those periods can be. And uh, Hannah Arendt, not everything she said um, uh, still holds water, but uh, much of what she said do does. And one of the points that she made about totalitarianism um, is that the first step towards a totalitarian regime is to create a society of lies where the truth, it's not, not only that the truth is disguised or suppressed, but the truth doesn't matter anymore. Um, so the three characters, I'll go through them very uh, fairly quickly. Uh, one is the, perhaps the most extraordinary, uh, is uh, called uh, Kawashima Yoshiko, that was her Japanese name, but she was a Manchu princess born in, in Peking, Beijing, um, at the time of the revolution, and her family were uh, Manchu uh, aristocracy, so they were very much part of the Qing dynasty, which fell in 1911 after the revolution. And all these three characters, by the way, are children of fallen empires. Um, so she, f she, she was born at a time that everything her family stood for collapsed. Dung Jun was her Chinese name, Eastern Jewel. And 
She was part of uh, a number of Manchus who were the, the, the people who, who, who were in power during the Qing dynasty in China, um, who had a dream of restoring uh, the, the Qing dynasty throne. And she thought, and her father thought, that this could be done in collaboration with the Japanese. And the Japanese, of course, played into this fantasy and their idea of liberating Asia from uh, Western imperialists and, and so on. And um, so she, she was born in that rather crazy world of revanchists and dreamers and um, uh, collaborators and so on, was raised in Japan. She was given by her father, and he used an extraordinary word, uh, phrase for this, as a gift to a Japanese friend of his who was an ultra-nationalist who also was a dreamer of uh, Asia without Western, in Western imperialists and Asia for the Asians, of course, under Japanese uh, control. Uh, she was given as a gift to him, uh, and he raised her in um, ultra-nationalist circles in Japan, which is how she got the name Kawashima Yoshiko. Might have raped her. Um, she, in any, any case, did not have very pleasant experiences with men, became a cross-dresser uh, before this was called trance or anything like that, wore male uniforms, cut her hair, went back to China and became a kind of mythical figure. The Manchu princess who was on the side of the Japanese um, in their uh, efforts to quote-unquote, liberate Asia. And part of the liberation was Manchukuo, which was this puppet state in Manchuria, which the Japanese pretended was the ideal modern Asian state where there would be no racism, uh, no we rapacious Western-style capitalism. Um, it would be the ideal independent state. Well, it was certainly not independent. It was not without racial prejudice. The Japanese were the Herrenvolk, uh, in Manchukuo, the whole thing, of, everything about Manchukuo is fake. And much of this book, of course, is about fakery, that you don't know what's true, what isn't. Nothing that these characters said about themselves or other people said about them can be taken at face value. So she became a kind of poster child of Japanese imperialism. And all kinds of things were made up in the press. There were movies made about her. her there were novels made even well in the 30s about her heroism and daring do, her private army and so on, how she fought alongside the Japanese. Now, the strange thing is that in 1945, when Japan was defeated, uh, she was arrested by the Chinese nationalists and tried as a traitor. But they used as evidence against her her own myths. So a lot of these made-up stories with which she'd collaborated were used against her in her trial uh, as evidence. And uh, she was uh, summarily, she was shot. So that's Kawashima Yoshiko. Then there is Felix Kersten, uh, who was a Baltic German born in, in Estonia. Um, uh, may or may not have fought in the German army in World War II, uh, World War I. This was one of these sort of uh, mysterious episodes. Um, turned out to have a, a great talent for massage. Went to Weimar period Berlin, which was a great period for wellness gurus and quacks and um, oriental mystics and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, he apparently found a masseur called Dr. Ko. Um, I've been through Germ um, Berlin telephone books at the time and so on. There's no trace of Dr. Ko. Also, what makes it suspicious that uh, in, in Kersten's retelling of his life story, which again is highly uh, dubious and unreliable, Dr. Ko was not only Chinese but perhaps what else also was, was trained by Tibetan monks. Well, the moment you hear Tibet, you start thinking this is the world of Tantan and so on. And, 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 and anyway, he, he became a, a masseur of the, of the great and the good in Europe, of aristocrats, the husband of the Dutch queen, uh, people like um, um, German uh, industrialists and so on. Um, uh, and uh, he managed... Um, by doing this to what he, he thought, he had this theory that very famous and successful people suffered particularly from all kinds of stomach pains and so on because they worked too hard and were too ambitious. Now, one of these was Heinrich Himmler. 
who often had the uh, Bhagavad Gita in his pocket, apparently. He was one of these sort of quasi-Hinduism enthusiasts and so on and so forth. Heinrich Himmler suffered from terrible stomach cramps. And um, one of the best books written about uh, uh, dictatorship was by Mao Zedong's doctor, Li Zhe and Lidra Sway called stomach cramps and migraine and so on uh, a communist disease. Of course, it wasn't a communist disease. It was a dictator's disease. And in dictatorial courts where you're constantly afraid of somebody knifing you in the back, uh, you get these psychosomatic uh, uh, pains. And the pains are real. Uh, Himmler suffered from this. Um, der uh, Dicke Buddha, as um, Kerstin was called by Himmler, was the only one who, who, who was able to help him uh, in his agony. And so Himmler made him into his private master. And Kerstin spent the war um, following Himmler, um, making the mass murderer feel more comfortable. Now, uh, he did do certain things. I mean, he claimed after the war, the mythology of Kerstin was really post-war, not during the war, unlike Kawashima Yoshiko. He claimed that he was actually a great resistance hero who, in exchange for promising that he could help Himmler's pain, managed to give Himmler lists of people to be released from concentration camps uh, and so on. Some of this is true. Um, former clients of his in particular, Himmler was... Uh, prepared to release, but not Jews, because that for Himmler was a matter of principle. But um, other people could be released sometimes. What is true is at the very end of the war, when Kerstin, who was, if, if nothing else, a very deft operator, had already, when he saw the end coming, moved his operations to, to Stockholm, um, he played a role as a mediator between the World Jewish Congress in Stockholm and Himmler. When Himmler was, was putting out feelers through people who worked for him, um, including Schellenberg, the, the um, security chief of the SD, that he, could, he, he hoped he could make a deal with the Allies that Germany, led by Himmler, of course, uh, along with the Allies, the Western Allies, would make war on the Bolsheviks. Um, he was prepared to make certain deals and release some Jews from concentration camps and so on. And an extraordinary meeting took place in February or April 1945 when the war was still going on between the head of the Jewish Congress in Stockholm and Himmler at Kerstin's um, country house in Brandenburg. And so there was Kerstin um, landing in Berlin with the Jewish representative, met by SS men who were all going Heil Hitler, um, the Jewish representative doffed his hat and said, Guten Abend, mein Herr. And they went to the country house where they met Himmler, and Himmler approached the uh, representative of the, of the uh, Jewish Congress with the immortal words, words, I think it might be time for our peoples to bury the hatchet. Um, <laughs> Some people were released as a consequence of this. So Kerstin played a role. But after the war, he knew that having been Himmler's personal masser was not the best way to burnish his credentials as the masser of the great and the good and the famous in Europe. So, uh, when the, and the Swedes, of course, had to also restore their reputation, which had been rather tarnished. Uh, so the, a kind of uh, um, competition for who had been bravest uh, emerged when uh, the Swedish negotiator with Himmler, uh, Count Bernardo, Volker Bernadotti, uh, as the Red Cross man, and who later was assassinated in Jerusalem uh, by um, uh, the Stern gang. Um, and he claimed that he, as the Swedish representative, had been responsible for releasing many Jews from concentration camps at the last minute, and that Kerstin wasn't mentioned in this. Now, Kerstin then wrote his own memoir, and by the way, uh, Bernadotte's memoir was written by Schellenberg, the SD security chief who temporarily had found refuge in Bernadotte's home in Sweden. So uh, uh, Kerstin then writes his own memoir, uh, claiming that he saved the entire Dutch population from being, in 1943, from being deported to Poland. Uh, he saved the French from starvation. He, he was a great resistance hero, uh, in short. So there was some effort to see whether these claims were true. Uh, some distinguished historians uh, 
thought that they were true, including Hugh Trevor Roper, later uh, the one who uh, claimed that Hitler's diaries, for, claimed for about 48 hours, but that Hitler's diaries were, were, were true. Um, Kirsten died uh, peacefully uh, without being um, prosecuted for anything. The third person, the most sinister perhaps, was uh, Friedrich Weinrepp. And Weinrepp was born in what is now Lviv, then Lvov, uh, in an assimilated Jewish family, which meant they spoke German at home. His mother was, uh, believed in the German superiority of the German culture. Franz Josef, Kaiser Franz Josef was the family hero and so on. Uh, they fled during World War I, uh, to, uh, first to Vienna and then to a seaside resort uh, near The Hague in, in the Netherlands, where none of them felt very comfortable. Like most German Jewish refugees, they found Holden very provincial. They missed their eider-down beds, uh, and besides, the German culture was superior to everything else, uh, etc. And to um, rebel against his parents, Weinrepp became, became uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, Hasid. Um, and he was one of those people who thought he was cleverer than everybody else. He could outfox the world. He, he basically he, he had contempt for everybody. He had contempt for the Dutch. He had contempt for um, assimilated Jews like his parents and their friends. He even had contempt for his fellow Orthodox Jews who he thought were fools. And he certainly had contempt for the Germans. And uh, in the first few years of the war, he came up with this, uh, th these lists um, that if you, in exchange for payment, if you applied for these lists, there was an element of the Madoff scandal in this. Uh, if you applied to be on these lists, he could arrange that you could be on a train to safety in Portugal or Spain or Switzerland. Um, and the list was backed by a German general von Schumann. Now, the list was a complete fantasy. German from the, uh, General von Schumann didn't exist, um, but he did take a lot of money and um, was arrested at one point. Uh, the SD, um, he then said to the SD who, who arrested him that General von Schumann was, never existed, was a fantasy. The SD wouldn't believe him because they thought the Wehrmacht were no good. It had to be true that there was a German Wehrmacht general who was in on this scam. So he then said to Kirsten, if you help us find this von Schumann, we'll let you, we'll, 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 we'll let you out of prison. This led to more and more weird, weirder and weirder adventures uh, during which Kirsten probably uh, betrayed fellow Jews um, and uh, in the end um, it was spent some time in Westerbork, the camp on the way to Auschwitz, um, in the end, uh, the ground became too hot under his feet and he had to uh, go into hiding with his family. Now, after the war, he, like Kawashima Yoshiko, uh, was arrested and tried for treachery and uh, fraud. Um, he tried to make a case that he was the Dutch Dreyfus and was helped by some people, and including some uh, organizations in the United States who, who believed him. Um, he was punished for some years, was then uh, given mercy, but, and, and was let out. Um, but um, in the 70s, when I was a student, uh, Kirsten, uh, not Kirsten, Weinrepp became very famous as a kind of Kabbalist uh, guru who was popular with middle-aged, rich, Gentile ladies who uh, took lessons from him in the meaning of life by uh, uh, reading the Bible according to his half-baked Kabbalist theories. I myself uh, uh, had a brush with this. Um, my best friend at university at the time, his grandmother was exactly one of these people, and my friend would go on Sunday Bible lessons uh, to, read, to, to read the Bible according to Weinrepp's um, theories. Um, I was studying classical Chinese at the time, and I remember still and wince with embarrassment that I said to my professors, we were reading a Han Dynasty text, I think, wouldn't it be interesting to interpret the Han Dynasty text through a numerical and perhaps pre-worldly mystical, and I could see their eyes rolling. <laughs> and I went back, and my friend and I put this down to bottomless superficiality of my professors. And this didn't last very long. But um, in any case, uh, um, Weinrepp in the 70s became a hero of the counter-establishment, counter-cultural left. 
as an example of somebody who uh, was in a sort of playful manner um, playing with the establishment and, and so on and so forth. I'll say a bit more about this later. Now, why am I in, was I interested in writing this book about these three people who don't, didn't know each other um, and didn't have very much in common except that they were collaborators in, in Hochstapler? Well, one reason, as I said, is that they were all children of broken empires with very complicated and divided loyalties. None of them really knew quite where they belonged. And I, even most historians, I think, have some kind of autobiographical interest in the subject they tackle. My, I myself, um, I'm not a child of a broken empire, but I did grow up with different parents from different countries and different religions and different cultures, so I sort of understand the feeling. But uh, I do make it clear in the introduction to my book that one has to be very careful with the assumption that people with, who have different backgrounds are also potentially treacherous or, or disloyal because when I think of my own grandparents who are the children of German Jewish immigrants in Britain, uh, they were, uh, did what many people, uh, immigrants do or children of immigrants. They plumped for once for, for their, their own country and became super patriotic. In other words, they were more British than the British in the way that their families had been more German than the Germans in the late 19th century. Um, the other reason is, as, as, as Dan already uh, uh, said, is the sort of zeitgeist uh, we're living through at the moment. Uh, a period in which uh, truth uh, or the concept of truth is in danger. Um, uh, not only from uh, Donald Trump and, and the populist right uh, and so on, um, but also really from, from a certain kind of left where influenced by, by Foucault and, and other th and postmodernist theories, the idea is that truth, that there is no such thing as objective truth, that, obje that the claim to objective truth is simply a fig leaf for the uh, privileged elite to impose their view on the marginalized, uh, and that truth is simply a question of, of relative power and representation and so on. So in other words, there is no such thing as truth. And um, I think this is uh, an extremely dangerous uh, uh, tendency, um, mainly for the reasons that Hannah Arendt pointed out, that if there's no truth, then everything becomes partisan. So in other words, if um, Donald Trump uh, lies through his teeth, it doesn't matter whether the New York Times uh, can correct all the mistakes or point them out. His supporters will simply say, well, that's the New York Times. I mean, they would say that. I mean, it's all partisan and so on. And um, the same uh, with representation. I'm very skeptical about the notion that um, whether it's art or whether it's uh, intellectual life, that um, what matters is who is saying because of who they are rather than what they're saying. Because there is something Volkish about that notion. It's a bit like the Nazi idea of that there is, there is no such thing as objective science. There is Jewish science, and there is uh, science of the German Volk. And I, I think a lot of people today um, uh, are not near, who, who, who are dangerously close to that kind of thinking are not necessarily neo-Nazis or fascists or even, they're often very well-meaning. But I think there is a, a, a danger in our time uh, of this undermining the concept uh, of truth. The third reason is that I grew up, uh, like all people of my generation, in the shadow of World War II. I was born in December 1951, so I didn't experience the war. But you could, it's haunted us, people of my age, or many of people of my age, and it will haunt me until I die. I mean, we, we, can't help, we can't get away from the war. And one of the things that, that very much marked my childhood growing up in, in, in the Netherlands in the 50s and 60s was in the 50s and early 60s this idea of good and bad. There was an ab these were absolute moral categories. You had the collaborators, the people you wouldn't, you wouldn't... We knew that we couldn't go and buy sweets at a certain tobacconist because the woman who worked there had, had, a, ger had, had uh, a German boyfriend during the war. We knew we couldn't go to a certain butcher because he was a collaborator, and so on. And these were absolute moral yardsticks. Whether you'd been good or bad in the war, whether you'd collaborated or not, uh, 
<clears throat> there were no gray zones. This was absolute. Only in the course of the 1960s, really, uh, did this begin to change, and we began to realize that sometimes good people had done bad things, bad people had done good things, P uh, people have done bad things for good reasons, uh, sometimes uh, in the same family. One uh, son would join the Waffen-SS to go and write, fight on the Eastern Front, while the other son went into the resistance for the same reasons because they wanted to get away, away from an authoritarian father, they were bored, they, were, they liked the idea of action, they wanted adventure, they wanted to travel, whatever it was. Uh, things were not so clear-cut in, in ideological terms. Same with, with uh, women who had German uh, lovers, by the way. I mean, very few, few, relatively few of them probably had German lovers because they were convinced Nazis. They had German lovers because... Uh, the local boys were um, poor and had bad teeth, and uh, you had these foreign soldiers who were, wore smart uniforms and were more exciting because you needed the food, because you wanted to dress nicely, because you were stuck in a horrible marriage. There are all kinds of reasons why the presence of foreign troops can actually be a liberating, uh, have a liberating effect. I don't need to tell... Uh, nobody here probably is of that age anymore, but I don't need to tell Germans uh, uh, what it was like in the first post-war years when to be a, an American was a very, even where you, if you were a hideous American with bad teeth, you still were treated as a sex god. So <laughs> it was no different, really, with, often for many people, with German troops in occupied Europe during the war. In other words, the temptations to, to, to not to be a hero... Uh, to uh, adapt, to compromise, and even to go over to the dark side, we're strong. And uh, that doesn't mean that being a collaborator or doing the wrong thing is more human than being, uh, doing the right thing, uh, but it is, to me, more interesting um, uh, as a writer. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't find heroes particularly interesting. I find f people who have failed in one way or, not, or another much more interesting, partly because I could probably identify with it more, uh, partly because it's uh, out of fear. Um, to claim that you would be a hero would be absurd arrogance. To think that you might have done the wrong thing just to be better off, uh, to, to get more power, to have more fun is more easier to imagine. I mean, I don't think I'm being completely perverse in, in making this, this claim. So that's, uh, those are the reasons why I wrote the book. Now, the last thing I will say um, is uh, an interesting aspect of the story, which is why the three, these three people after the war still appeal to the imagination to such a large extent. And I think that the reasons were different. I think in the case of Felix Kerstin, uh, Himmler's Masser, um, it had to do with class. That Kerstin, like, like butlers, um, was somebody who, was very, who adored to serve people who were powerful and rich. He liked to be a fixer. Um, he liked to be uh, an operator, somebody who was in the know, and so on. All three, in fact, were a bit like that. And um, the people who needed to be rehabilitated very quickly after, a war, after the war, in Germany, perhaps more than in any, any other country, was the old elite that had dirty hands, the, the bankers, the industrialists, the, uh, not the concentration camp guards or the women who'd had German lovers. That was, they were the ones who got it in the, well, the women got it in the neck before anybody else, but they were less guilty than... Uh, than Flick or, or uh, you know, the people who ran Siemens or uh, the, the Krups and so on. And, but they had to be brought back, back very quickly because you couldn't rebuild a country like Germany and countries that had been on, under occupation too without, the, the, uh, in, uh, without in, incorporating the old elites that, that often had blood on their hands, even indirectly. You needed these people, diplomats, professors, doctors, and there are people of the age in this room who, pro who I'm sure remember um, having been, had, you know, growing up, knowing that your professors and your doctors and so on uh, were not so kosher, and I can only commiserate with them. Um, so, and Kerstin was a, a typical servant of that class, and it, it, it was in the interest of that class uh, 
to sort of see Kirsten's story of heroism and so on, uh, and also Kirsten's attempt to, to pretend that the Flicks and others whom he'd served before the war and during the war were actually very decent people, um, uh, which was very much part of his post-war um, presentation. The case of Weinrepp is perhaps the most extraordinary uh, in that he appealed to the, the, the generation that came of age in the 60s, the 68ers, the people who in Germany would have had teachers and, 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 and so on who had, been, uh, had, a, had a brown past. Um, the 68 generation in Holland, in Japan, in Italy, in Germany, and so on, everywhere, France, felt that they had to make up for their parents. Their parents had looked the other way, their parents had collaborated, their parents were no good, they were going to be the resistors. And um, in an, in an extreme example, of course, is the hijacking of the, I think, was it the El Al flight in Entebbe, when uh, members of the German uh, 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 Rote Armee, the first thing they did was separate the, passenger, the Jews from the non-Jews amongst the passengers because the Jews were complicit with Israel and they were pro-Palestinian, not knowing what they were doing, I hope. But it's an example of, of <coughs> wanting to resist uh, because you know that your parents didn't, um, that can be, take perverse forms in that case. In Holland, it wasn't quite like that, but there were, the, the, the generation did see themselves as resistors. Um, the, the police were uh, very quickly, the, the, the police that would, would try and, and, and would, uh, the riot police that would stop demonstrations in Amsterdam and so on were very often very quickly compared to the SS, uh, the mayor of Amsterdam was denounced for not standing up, to, for standing up to the, or trying to impose some kind of order on the rebellions in the 1960s was compared to a, a kind of crypto-Nazi. The poor mayor himself had been in the resistance during the war. So there was this air of resistance, of, of pretending to be a, a resistance fighter for making up for what your parents had not done and so on and so forth. And Weinrepp was the perfect hero. He was the, 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 the Dutch Dreyfus suddenly made his reappearance. And he was seen as the sort of the, 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 the protester against the hypocrisy of the establishment, the same establishment, the bureaucracy and so on, that had collab made life easier for the German occupiers German, during uh, World War II. The, some of the people who... Uh, this, is, this is where it gets a little tricky, and, and we could perhaps get into that later. But some of the people, the, the main defenders of Weinrepp, were themselves Jewish, but often half Jewish, uncomfortable with it, and so on. And they saw Weinrepp as, as the sort of the, the wonder rabbi who could solve their identity problems. Uh, so that's Weinrepp. And the last one, Kawashima. Well, Nobody in Japan, well, I wouldn't say nobody, but almost nobody in Japan has any nostalgia for militarism, uh, for uh, um, defending um, the invasion of China, uh, for the massacres in Nanking. I mean, there are people who say it wasn't as bad as people say, and that it, a lot of it's left-wing propaganda and so on. But in any case, the, the war is still a source of some shame, uh, at, uh, uh, certainly embarrassment. But the Japanese experiment in Manchukuo, the puppet state in northeastern China, the idea of having a sort of an Asian empire, the idea of going to the Asian continent and having uh, escaping from the Japanese islands for being part of a wider Asian story, that still has a kind of romantic appeal. And so the, the notion of this Manchu princess who was on the side of the Japanese in an experiment that went horribly wrong, but that was in origin still a respectable um, and r even romantic notion of Japan joining Asians in liberating Asia and so on. So has still has a kind of romance. And so there still are films about her and there are even uh, manga, uh, comic books about her. And the fact that she was a cross-dresser these days, of course, makes her an even more appealing figure for a, a, a much younger generation for whom that is perhaps more important than Manchu Kuo or uh, the Asian dream. So, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. We know that history, the way history is remembered and the way history comes down is largely through myth, uh, 
through stories. It's not professional historians. It, it comes through to Hollywood movies, through television series, uh, myths. These are our modern myths, and we need myths. We need to tell ourselves stories uh, to have a sense of who we are, to have a, an idea of history that makes a certain uh, narrative sense, and so on. History is showbiz. But if we need that, uh, and this is really one of the main points I'm trying to make, we also need uh, people uh, who continue to dismantle and debunk uh, the myths for our, all our sakes. And I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much, Ian. That was fascinating. Um, a point of fact, as long as we're talking about myths and non-myths, um, Yoshiko actually shows up in um, The Last Emperor. Yes. Is that, 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 it's that character, yes. that cross yes. Because she was the only character of the three who I had ever heard of, and uh -huh. I'm so I'm, uh, and she's also, in, in my view, I think probably the least guilty of the three. She probably had the least blood on her hands of anyone. Or, I don't know. It's a tough one. It depends. <laughs> it depends what to believe. Yeah, it's hard to know. <laughs> Um, but what was the what led you to the other uh, two, or what led you to all three, and what what was the principle of inclusion? Because there's no shortage of uh, you know rascally people who came out of the war. Well, they were good stories. Yeah, and um, oh. and I knew I had known about all three. I mean, Vine Rep, everybody in, in Holland um, of, of a certain age uh, remembers him. Uh, Kawashima Yoshiko, I knew about because I knew one of her best friends, uh, which is an, uh, also an extraordinary story. And I, I wrote a book about her, but I, 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 only, I wrote it as a novel because it was so, nobody would believe it if you write it as nonfiction. She was a woman who was born in Manchukuo. Her father taught Chinese uh, to um, Japanese uh, who worked for the Manchu, Manchurian Railways. Um, and they had a very big modern film studio in Manchukuo, the most modern film studio in Asia, the Japanese. And it was uh, to provide uh, propaganda films. And they were looking for a Chinese actress um, who could play a, the, sort of the Chinese who fell in love with the brave Japanese soldiers and pioneers. And so on. they couldn't find one because the Chinese actresses didn't speak Japanese. And so they found this woman in a radio song contest who was perfectly bilingual in Chinese and Japanese. They made her into a Chinese actress called Li Xianglang. And it was a state secret that she was actually Japanese called Yamaguchi, um, um, I'm having a senior Yoshiko. moment. Yoshiko. Yeah. And uh, so she played these roles as the Chinese who fell in love with, with uh, uh, Japanese soldiers. These films were not popular in China, but they were very popular in Japan. And this is a difference between the war in Europe and the war in Asia, that even as the Japanese were slaughtering tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of people in Nanking, and where, there was a China boom in Japan with Li Xianglan, who gave concerts in Japan in a sort of Chongsam, sort of fake Orientalist Chinese songs. And everybody, all the Japanese girls wanted to look like her and so on. Anyway, she was, uh, at the end of the war, uh, was also uh, arrested, but could prove that she, unlike the other Yoshiko, that she was uh, Japanese. Uh, so she was uh, let off, and I knew her and met her in the um, 90s after she'd had a career um, of her own, anyway. So that's how I knew about her. And the Weinrepp story, uh, the Kerstin story, I'd known about also, and in fact, in the Early 90s, I'd proposed it as a film script to somebody. I thought it would make a great movie. Nobody was in the slightest bit interested. Um, right now, Woody Harrelson is going to play him uh, in a film uh, based on the book by Joseph Kessel, who is a French journalist, former resistor, writer of Belle du Jour, among other things, whom I admire enormously. But he wrote a book where he completely fell for Kirsten's uh, uh, mythology, and I think there's a certain tension at the moment, possibly, between the director, who knows perfectly well what happened, and Woody, who wants, want, who wants to play him as a hero. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any also rounds? Uh, no, not really. No. no, once I had 
Those three? Those three, yeah. No, I didn't want to be distracted. So one of the interesting things that you illustrate so well in the, in the book is, in particular in the German context, but to some extent or the European context, a bit also in the Asian context, just how utterly shambolic these regimes were and uh, what nests of vipers they were and how everyone is fighting against <laughs> everyone. I mean, it's the Hobbesian war of everyone against each other. Yes, but I think that's probably true of most dictatorships, and partly because it's in the interest of the dictator to have everybody <coughs> beneath them fight each other. Um, but the rivalry, yeah, of course, was intense. And, uh, and, and, and it's another result of not being able to speak the truth. I mean, you see it in Xi Jinping's China today. I mean, that if, if the leader doesn't get the truth because nobody dares to tell him, you get the, the most horrible blunders. And um, uh, so I think that's part and parcel with the system. But the other thing that struck me as being kind of hard to wrap my ma mind around was, you know, how could such a, I don't know, a hierarchical system allow a masseur to, you know, have so much access, if not actually power. Well, that's, yeah, that's a very interesting thing. It, it was, in fact, Hugh Trevor Roper who first put me on to Kerstin. And he was the, Trevor Roper was the son of a doctor, so he was very interested in medical men. He was also interested in fraudsters. It's oddly for a man who fell for, for them too many times. But um, uh, he told me, because he, his, his, one of his most interesting books was The Last Days of Hitler. And he came to Berlin in 1945 and interviewed a lot of the people who'd been with Hitler in the bunker and so on, including the doctors and, and so on. And he told me how there was a sort of horrible rivalry at these despotic courts around Hitler, Hitler as much as around Himmler, of the astrologer, the doctor, the masser, and so on. And they all uh, want, they wanted power by ac having more access to the, the, uh, the, you know, the great man. Um, uh, but they were themselves very vulnerable because if you were a doctor, uh, if you were Hitler's doctor or Himmler's doctor, you're the one person that they are completely dependent on. So... Um, uh, that gives you a, 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 a certain amount of power, of course. You become their confidant. Also, Kerstin's relationship with him, uh, Himmler, a little bit like some women with their, with, in the old days, uh, with their hairdressers or uh, men with their butlers, that um, you, know, you, you confide in them because they're so much lower than you are, in a way, that you can say things to them you wouldn't say to your, your best friends. So they, they, they had a position of, of great influence, and at the same time, if things went wrong with the health of Himmler or Hitler or whoever it was, Mao, uh, you were responsible. So um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Is that how un odd it was that a... Oh, the, the shambolic would, nature, yeah. The shambolic nature, but also that a masseur would... And the, no, that's why they had yeah. so much influence, I yeah. think. Yeah. And... Uh, I mean, he seems like he was a miracle worker. Was, well, like, that, in his own that, I'm sure, but, yeah. but, you know, they all kept him around, and one, I mean, they were sort of passing him around, you know, to this baron and that baron. I think he probably was a very good masseur. Yeah. It, it was the, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for someone of that quality myself. Well, yeah. they're, they're probably rare. Which yeah, is why. I, I, I would have, uh, I would have thought so. Um, well, anyway, I'm going to have some more questions, I'm sure, but why don't we open it up to floor. Please put up your hand. Yeah, great. And wait for the microphone. Right there. Um, I'm very, very, very excited to ask you a question. Um, <clears throat> I was 10 years old when you wrote about um, the future of democracy in Asia. Uh -huh. So uh, 25 years later now, well, at the time, the one who wrote, uh, who read your writings, uh, were student activists. Where? In Myanmar. In Myanmar. Burma. Uh -huh. yeah. So, like, after twenty-five years, are you still seeing the future of Asia as the way you see, like you had seen, you have foreseen at that time? Yeah. Well, 
I, the last time I was in your country was um, in, two, in 1986, so it was even before the election. I hasn't gone yet. No. <laughs> and so I saw a very different country. I mean, even under Nguyen, it was better than it is now. Um, I don't think you can really... It's, it's difficult to generalize about Asia because I think the different countries are so different. And it wasn't so long ago that um, Burma or Myanmar uh, was looking more pro hopeful and promising than Thailand. Whereas now they're going to have an election in Thailand and the opposition might possibly win. And so these things fluctuate so much. And so I'd be wary of making great statements about how I see the future of Asia. I think it, it really depends on the country. I think I, since I haven't been to, been to your country for so long, I, I would be even more diffident about saying anything. But um, it's certainly not looking good. And partly because I don't think the Chinese will do anything to put pressure on the military government. Um, on the other hand, the opposition is very strong and, and very um, fierce. They're not going to give up. Uh, so... Um, I foresee that there'll probably be quite a lot of violence, and in the end, the military will probably lose. But you know, as they say, in the end, we're all dead. I'm sorry to be so horribly pessimistic. You're supposed to save that for the end, I think. <laughs> uh, back here, please. Yes, you mentioned earlier uh, two names: Donald Trump and Bernie Madoff. And if you were to start writing your book today. Uh, would they be part of the three most uh, disreputable characters that you write about, are there, uh, or are there others? No, no, I think there are, uh, I think there are more uh, disreputable characters than either um, uh, Weinrep or Madoff. What I meant by that is that he, Weinrep used the same tricks. One of them was to say to people who wanted to be on his list, these desperate people who, who would do anything to get out because they knew, they, they knew pretty well what was going to happen to them. And he would say often to them, in the way that Madoff did, he would say, no, no, I'm, I'm afraid the list is full. It's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, you have to be patient, but I don't think so. Which gave, gave people, it became almost a status symbol to be on his list. As it, and Madoff did exactly the same. It gave him credibility by making it hard to be on this list. That was the, the comparison. And it wasn't a, uh, to say that, I mean, neither of them are particularly reputable figures, but there are worse. Well, while we're on uh, Hochstapler, um, you know, in the U.S., we, two of the leading, uh, you know, examples of the, of the genus have been mentioned, but... Uh, the one that you kind of that I wonder how he slips through is this guy who's in Congress now from a district not far from yeah. you, who has never told uh, uh, you know said an honest word about himself. No, he's, a re he's a real hochstapler, and, and it's an extraordinary case. This is George Santos. For those, I think you've all heard of him, um, but. Um, you know, it, this is not a, uh, we're not in the middle of a world war. It's quite extraordinary that he got through. But he's a sort of, he, yeah, he's hard to take seriously because he, he's such a sort of minor figure in many ways, but, but very symptomatic you, you of know what Trump has done. You know, that was said of a, of a failed painter, I know, too, I know. once. I don't see Santos. I don't think <laughs> Santos has the, has the balls or the yeah. brains. Or, but the, the, I, Talking about disreputable people, I think Trump is a much, much more dangerous p figure than, than, than Madoff ever was. Madoff is just a fraudster. Uh, it's very sad that a lot of people lost their money, but I mean, that's it. Whereas Trump, uh, and, Trump and I, I d also don't believe what some people say, uh, you know, liberal friends of mine, ah, oh, well, but um, uh, DeSantis is perhaps worse. No, he's not worse. Trump is, is a bit like Hitler in that he's a, I think he's a, 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 a psychopath. And, um, uh, and, and what, what happens when you get people... Trump's America was not a dictatorship. Um, it's not a, you can't compare it at all to anything like the Third Reich. It would be absurd to do that. But you, saw, you could see certain phenomenon, phenomena that were reminiscent of it. And one is that if you have a figure like Trump who encourages 
um, uh, uh, resentful um, criminal chances. People who'd never, in, a normal, in normal circumstances, would never be anywhere near power. Those sort of people suddenly emerge. I mean, somebody like, what's his first name? Stone. Uh, Roger. Roger Stone. Yeah. He's a man who in the Third Reich would have done very well. <laughs> because in a normal, in a normal de democracy, a man like Roger Stone would not have been anywhere near power. But when you have a leader who encourages that kind of thing and plays onto, into people's basest instincts, and um, then uh, you get a Santos who's probably not even that malevolent. I think Stone is malevolent. But, um, uh, yeah, you get, get malevolent Hochstapler. But what, what is it in the uh, ecosystem that, you know, has opened the door to either a Stone or a Santos or a Trump? That's really the question. I think in widespread... Case, it's the polarization precedes yes, the... Yes, uh, widespread fear and resentment. I yeah. mean, when you have enough people who feel that they've been left behind, the word, world is against them, they've been, they're, they're losing their grip on status, etc., uh, etc. Et and you get a demagogue who plays into those, those very dark sentiments of, of wanting to um, have exact revenge against people who you think were always better than you and so on. Uh, then you get that kind of phenomenon. Right. Um, it sounded a bit like you were distancing yourself from your subjects when you very casually said, of course I'm not the child of a lost empire. To my Dutch ears, that sounds very odd for somebody who was born and raised in The Hague. Um, you must know the Dutch saying, India verloren, yeah. Rome spoed geboren, when we lost Indonesia, misery started. Um, <laughs> And, and, and maybe if you, if you compare the size of the motherland to the, that of the former colonies, the loss of the Dutch Empire was probably the biggest in the last hundred years. Yes, except I don't think, you're right, that The Hague was full of um, uh, nostalgic um, people who had idyllic childhood, childhoods in the Dutch East Indies and hated the climate and uh, all that. Um, first of all, I didn't grow up in those circles. Um, my family had nothing to do with the East Indies. Um, and by what I mean by the children of broken empires, in the case of these three people, they, they lost their identities in some way, one way or another. I mean, if you were a Manchu in China after the revolution, you were suddenly a nobody. And, uh, and loss of status, I think, has a lot to do, and that, that's true of the, a lot of people who, work, who vote for Trump. I mean, they think that gays and black people and women and so on are sort of taking over the country and they'll be thrown in the dustbin, these sort of white, resentful people. And th th there are such people in the case of Holland or, or Britain or France when they lost their empires, but they were people who lived there usually, um, uh, who suddenly had to come back and, 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 and uh, resented it. But that was far from my experience. So my experience was, was certainly marked by um, having parents from very different, different countries, but nothing to do with the it's collapse more of the a empire. Than a yeah. Yeah. Thing. yeah. Okay. Mr. Connolly, or Professor Connolly, I should say. Thank you, Ian, for a fascinating presentation. I was um, mystified and struck by the figure of Heinrich Himmler. Uh, who acted in a very surprising way. A sweet man. Uh, well, you know, um, Hitler's testament, he does a few things that I recall. Well, one of them is he kicks Himmler out of the party, as I recall. Uh, but he also, uh, I think in the last paragraph, he warns the German people about the continuing power of the Jewish people. This is after the Holocaust has essentially been affected. So six million Jews have been killed, and Hitler is still obsessed with the Jewish power. Um, so looking at Himmler for a moment, willing a few weeks earlier to meet with representatives, was it the World Jewish Congress? Yes. Which, uh, in, in, on, on German territory, um, a man whom we, we think of as actually being ideologically very close to Hitler, behaving in a way that Hitler never would have. No, that's true. What, what did we learn about Nazi ideology? Was it, was it complete? Was it, he seems to be an opportunist of a sort. Well, that's a very I mean, good question. How coherent was it? I mean, what, what, what do we learn from, about the system, about the ideology, by essentially the number two, 
figure behaving in the way that you describe? That's a very good question. I think it's, you could ask that question of any ideological uh, dicta dictatorial system. I mean, to what extent do people really believe it? To what extent are they only in it because of the power and so on? It varies very much from person to person. Himmler was particularly complicated because he was a fanatic and believed in all kinds of weird mumbo-jumbo um, about race and so on, to the extent that some of his colleagues thought he was a bit of a crank. On the other hand, he was indeed prepared at the end of the war to strike all kinds of deals, maybe because his loathing of the, what he saw as the Slavic Untermenschen and the, the barbaric hordes from the East and Russia and so on, uh, was almost as strong as his anti-Semitism. And he had delusions. I mean, he had delusions of grandeur anyway. So he had delusions that he could be the new leader of Germany. And he had delusions that, that the Western allies would join him and turn around and go to war with the, 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 the Asiatic hordes. And um, so what does that tell us? I think that in some cases like Himmler's, there may be a little bit of both depending on circumstances that you can be a fanatic on the one hand and you're prepared to make deals when it suits you on the other. Hitler is probably sui generis. I mean, I think you're probably right that Hitler w would not have been prepared to make any kind of compromise or deal. I mean, uh, uh, or Goebbels. Uh, Goebbels, I'm not so sure. I think there was an element of... S Goebbels was a, f a worshipper of, of the Führer whether Goebbels would have been incapable of striking some kind of deal if he'd come out of it better? Uh, who am I? I'm not, thank goodness I'm not in Goebbels' head, but uh, I don't know. Goering would. Probably, yeah. Almost certainly, yeah. And Speer. Thanks for, for, thanks for a great, great talk and uh, for turning our attention to the appeal of those three people after 1945. I mean, do you think that part of the appeal is that they are prone to belittle dictatorships, make people feel comfortable, even, you know, make them ridiculing dictatorships, you know, after 1945, and thus thereby serving kind of apologetic needs and uh, tendencies. I mean, if you belittle a dictatorship after the fall of the dictatorship, or the three dictatorships, if you ridicule them, it's, it leaves you, I mean, it takes a bit of burden on, uh, off you, you know, it makes, it serves apologetic needs, of course, on the part of the population. So, when we turn the table, I think this might be a kind of common feature that That, that explains the success, if you like, or the appeal of these three stories, I mean, up, up to the present, possibly. Well, maybe, but, and I agree with you that, that, that a, a clever um, a novelist or film director could probably make three fine dark comedies about all three of these people, but I don't think that that's the appeal. I think that in the case of Weinhoff, as I said, I mean, he really was seen as a kind of resistance hero of, of a kind. Um, Kirsten, if you take Joseph Kessel's book, which is the best sort of hagiography on Kirsten, um, he certainly doesn't see him as a comic figure. I mean, he sees him as, as a real hero. Um, and um, the case of Kawashima Yoshiko, I don't think the Japanese, although it's certainly have a sense of humor of, of their own, um, would find... Manchukuo uh, particularly comical or even her role in it um, I, I might be wrong but I'd, I'd be surprised I mean I agree with you that, that, that um, ridicule is the form of criticism that dictators themselves of course including Trump uh, find most disturbing so uh, Charlie Chaplin's the great dictator even though Chaplin later said he was embarrassed by it and he wouldn't have made the same film because it was pre-Holocaust and when it was made and he didn't, if he'd known, um, is 
and, 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 and Lubitsch is to be or not to be, I think it was the same thing, but actually the great dictator is still one of the most effective criticisms of, of the Third Reich and, and from the point of view of, of, of Hitler and his supporters probably much more painful than a more, um, how shall I put it, a, a sort of harsher criticism. I mean, Voltaire said this about the Catholic Church. Questions? Ah. Um, thank you for addressing uh, collaboration as a, new, a universal topic, not something which is limited to one nation or one um, a historical area or even geographic area. Um, in, in this leaflet, uh, actually Ukraine is mentioned. And I think we should also think about Russia currently where this topic is like, very high on, you know, everybody's, like, everybody thinks about mm -hmm. collaboration. Um, and we have sanctions, which are also about collaboration. So this is all very important, not so much for us now, but we, we could theoretically learn from history and maybe also try to advise people in other countries how to deal, like, for example, with these cases in the Netherlands, where you had the uh, as you said, good and bad, you know, it's kind of like black and mm. white difference. So this is like my, my one question, like a practical question, whether there are some, you know, where something could come out of this. Also, especially in Europe, after the war is over. And the other very practical question, um, did you use only um, other secondary literature plus novels, uh, memoirs, or did you also go to archives? Right. Well, I'll, ask, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, I did both. Um, but um, the first question, um, I myself am, am skeptical of the, who was it? The, 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 not Dos Passos, but who was the American novelist who said if we don't learn from the Faulkner. past, sorry? Faulkner. Faulkner. No, 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 it wasn't no. Faulkner. It was Santayana. Sa Santayana. If we don't learn from the past, we'll, we're doomed to repeat it. I'm, I don't quite buy that because I don't think we can learn from history and then we often learn the wrong lessons from history. I mean, we need to know history in order to understand ourselves and, where we, and our times and where we come from and so on. But the idea of using history to draw lessons, I'm, I'm, I'm very skeptical. Um, but what is true is that you can see parallels. And um, in the current situation in Russia and the R Ukraine, I, I, I could um, note two. One is that I'm, I'm now working on a book on, on daily life in Berlin um, f during the war from 39 to 45. And, all the, and the, the phenomenon I'm talking about perhaps takes place a little bit earlier. But what you now see in Russia is something you saw in the, vi in, in the early, th in the 30s in, in Germany which was that question of do you, if, you're, if you're against the regime and you're able to leave, which is, of course, always a minority of people, do you leave facing an uncertain future um, and so on? Do you stay? Um, and one of the most interesting books on this topic I've found so far is Erich Kästner's Das Blaue Buch, where he says, I'm a German, this is my language, why should I leave my country? Uh, I can bear witness. Uh, but you have to make compromises, which he's very honest about. And the thing is that the, those who leave are hated by those who stay, and those who stay are hated by those who leave. And you see this in Russia now, exactly the same thing. And the other thing, and um, Susan Glasser, who's here, pro probably knows who I mean, but there was a very good um, piece in The New Yorker not so very long ago by somebody who was describing, I think it was The New Yorker, describing the... Uh, phenomenon of, of collaboration in Ukraine. When you had a town that was Ukrainian, then occupied by Russian troops, uh, and you had a local uh, guy in authority, uh, a mayor or somebody else, um, who then had to take care of people getting fed. And that to make sure that, that, the, that things didn't just completely collapse so that people would, would starve. <laughs> 
So he had to cooperate, co cooperate to some extent with the Russians in order to make sure that things were, sort of, that daily life could go on. Then the Ukrainians come back and those people are arrested as, uh, as, as collaborators and traitors. Well, you know, that shows how hard these issues are. And again, however horrible the invasion of Ukraine is, it's not quite yet uh, World War II or anything like it, but you see the same psychological things taking place. And in that sense, you can learn from history in order to recognize it and understand it, but not, you know, we, if we know history, we can somehow, the world would be great if, uh, that I don't believe. A question right here. But surely it'd be better. Not necessarily. Oh. No, we can learn the worst. We can learn the wrong. I mean, one of the reasons that we're living in a city now that was mostly destroyed is that the, uh, the, the, on the Allied side, um, a lot of the military um, authorities who'd gone through trench warfare in World War I wanted to do everything to avoid a war of, of military attrition again. So they thought bombing the hell out of the enemy would break their morale and would prevent us from the horrors of World War I. Well, you know, it was, it was different set of look horrors. around us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not in this house. But. Yeah, um, um, I, would, I would like to say that I um, would underline everything you said. Uh, and especially what you said to our times. But I think it was definitely enlightenment, uh, what we heard. My question is the following. You are happily Netherlandish. I foresee a reception in, in Germany that would argue that is notori notoriously uh, brought forward. Explaining means understanding. Understanding is forgiving. And when you say I'm attracted more by these people by, than by heroes, then it is also claiming of sympathy. And um, how would you re respond to, uh, to, to this argumentation, which will definitely come, yes. with, that argues what you said rightly uh, to Foucault falls on you? Yes. No, th 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 that's right. I mean, on the whole, this book has received very kind um, notices. I had one negative review where exactly that point was made. I mean, why, did, why wasn't I more... Uh, um, didn't I condemn these fa characters with more moral fervor and so on? Didn't I understand how, what terrible things they've done? Well, first of all, that assumes that the readers aren't adults and have to be told that, you know, the Third Reich was no good and co collaborating with Himmler was not necessarily the best thing to do and so on and so forth. I don't think you need to tell people that. But it's something that I'm afraid has been part of my entire working life because I see no um, merit in voicing outrage or, or, or expressing indignation. I mean, in certain things it is. I mean, if, if you, of course, if you're writing a pamphlet or uh, you're a, a, a political activist. But if you're writing a, a, a work of history um, or a novel or anything like that, then voicing outrage is not interesting. You want to, to understand people and what makes them tick, and uh, including bad people. And... Uh, y y does that make you more sympathetic to them? In a way, of course it does, because there is a s sense of fellow human feeling, which also means that some people are probably Im impossible to fictionalize. I don't think it's, it would be, perhaps it would be impossible to write a really interesting novel of, from the point of view of Hitler. I mean, that would be a stretch. But there are, there are many people... Steiner who, who, tried it. Yeah, Didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah, but that was such a sort of weird fantasy. But on the whole, I mean, very few people are completely good and completely bad. And the ones that are completely good are almost as boring as people who are completely bad. And so it's, the, it's, the, it's those in-between areas you want to get at, as a, I think, as a, a writer. And here I make no distinction between fiction and non-fiction. And, um, okay, so if people think that means that you're, uh, you're soft or, or not moral enough, well, soi. You remind me of that Orwell essay on Gandhi about 
Orwell, I think, probably upset a lot of people when he said saints are incredibly boring. They are incredibly and, boring. And, yeah. and really not a lot of fun to be around either, no. as he said. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Um, you wrote a book about three chancers or frosters in, uh, let's say, dictatorial circumstances. If you now sit down and try to write about three fraudsters, chancers in democratic societies, what will be the key difference? Um, well, the key difference, as long as a society is democratic, they probably can do less damage. That's probably the key difference. And that um, in a society that, um, which encourages violence and revenge and so on, these kind of people can do serious harm. Whereas, in a, which is in a way the difference between somebody like Madoff and, and, a, and a fraudster and a collaborator under a Nazi regime. I mean, Madoff did real harm, but relatively, I mean, nobody went to a concentration camp because of Madoff. And I think that's a fairly considerable difference. See a hand back there, raised cautiously. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe two different questions. One, um, you spoke about the Netherlands and Ukraine and collaboration. Could you give us an advice on transitional justice going forward <coughs> in Ukraine? And the second part is because you, you talked about information being blurred by, yeah, blurred in general because uh, alternative realities come into play. <coughs> What will AI do to your perception of reality and facts and truth. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm terrible at giving advice. I, 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 I'll drop that. Um, I'm, I don't know uh, really what the consequences are going to be of AI. Um, I'm not terrified of AI because, uh, well, it depends on what, what, what inspires fear. I think what AI can't do is develop an, an original thought, I don't think. It can fake a lot of things. But what is more dangerous than AI itself is the, the state of social media <coughs> and the Internet as it exists today, which is that uh, uh, pernicious nonsense, um, violent nonsense, can be spread to millions in, in seconds. And that makes um, maintaining a democracy much, much more difficult because a democracy or a liberal democracy does depend on that people have a certain amount of reliable information and um, that utter nonsense um, uh, can be quickly debunked and, and uh, made less noxious. That's much more difficult now. I think that's a more, more uh, bigger problem than AI, it seems to me. There's nobody online who, who's, partly because of the collapse of, all kind of, of every, sort, every form of authority, And so the way that information would come to people traditionally is that it's filtered um, through editors and uh, so on and so forth. When it's unfiltered, the sort of cranky nonsense that would find its way in letters to the editor and that the, the, the editor in a newspaper, those letters would immediately throw away, that can now be spread to millions. Wouldn't you agree there's another uh, problem as well, which is that um, the plenitude of data, if not information, just makes it so much easier to slip complete baloney in. I mean, yes. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we talked about Santos, but, you know, the, the man who was um, the head of the Freedom Caucus and then Donald Trump's Uh, chief of staff, you know, lied about his education for years. There's another woman in the Congress who's done the same thing that Santos has done, completely fabricated a past. Yeah. And the fact is, you know, only the New Yorker still has fact checkers um, or maybe a few other publications. But, you know, no one is no. checking these things at all. No, but well, that is the big danger. But the, 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 
people don't know what to believe because there's too much coming at them. Right. That's one thing. But the, what you always had were there was a certain trust in people whose job it was to, uh, to separate utter nonsense from something that was at least plausible, that would, would, would at least test its truth. In the media, in publishing, publishers, in, it doesn't matter what. And that's under attack now from, from different sides. It's attacked by the populist right, for all the reasons we know. But it's also attacked, I, I think, that the, this notion of that, that um, it's more important who says what than what they say is also dangerous. Because the question should be about any... Um, expression um, should be does, is it true or not? Does it ring true or not? Not who said it. And um, uh, I mean again this is this, this idea is promoted by well-meaning people but I, 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 that's also a threat. <coughs> Further questions? Was that a hand? <coughs> okay well there's here is from one of the gatekeepers of the truth, yes. Thanks. I'm a very bad journalist because I'm always shy to ask questions, especially in a, like at a press conference. Um, but I was just thinking about what you said. at the beginning. I'm Valerie Hopkins, and I am a Moscow correspondent for the New York Times. And I have been there um, until the end of March covering uh, the war from inside Russia. And I was thinking about what you said um, Paraphrasing Hannah Arendt, uh, that you know these governments create a society in which the truth doesn't matter, and I'm right. just wondering if you know, based on your experience and also about the book that you're writing now, um, if there's a point where that stops, right? And all of a sudden, the, certainly the truth doesn't matter, but the government narrative actually does take control, and the, that what was an absence of, of trust and a total di uh, lack of belief in anything uh, sort of switches into to a to a trust in, or a belief or a desire, at least, to believe what the government says. Yes, no, that, that's a very good question. First of all, I, I salute you for what you've been doing. Um, I think it's very interesting, actually, to read Mein Kampf on this subject. Because, <laughs> no, he, 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 Hitler talked about this and, and how to convince um, people of, of, a, of a particular line. And it goes in two stages, and I think this is where, where Arendt really uh, was quite right. That it, you start by saying the truth it doesn't exist, it's all a lie, it's, it's all partisan, it's all race, or whatever it is. And then you would start imposing your own version of truth. And, and Hitler describes how he does that. He said, facts don't matter. He, sa he says somewhere, I'm paraphrasing it, paraphrasing it. He says, what matters is to get at people's feelings. And um, once you do that, you can convince them very easily. And so it's, it's those two things. Facts don't matter, and then you work on the emotions. And again, I mean, I, Trump is not Adolf Hitler, but he, he, you, he, he, he has a very fine feeling for exactly the same thing. He understands it instinctively, I think. I don't think he... I mean, Hitler was probably better... Was more in, I don't know if he was more intelligent than Trump, but he'd read more books. <laughs> and, no, that's for, that's for sure, which is not very difficult. But, uh, but, he, but he was able to, to describe the process in a way that Trump probably would be incapable of. But Trump understands it. And then, of course, there's Steve Bannon, which is just... Well, he's much brighter. Yeah. yeah. Although also, maybe not a full deck, but, you know, flood the zone with... Barnyard expletive. Well, he's a truly sinister yeah. character, yeah. But, but he does have a... He's, I see him as a much more European figure than an American one because he comes out of that sort of very reactionary Catholic world of the Action Francaise and so on, which in America there's much less of that. I mean, he's not a guy with a baseball cap back to front who, and, a, and a sort of a cowboy hat, and, or, or not a cowboy hat and a baseball cap back to front. You kind of both, but, but you know maybe what a, I mean. Maybe a baseball bat. A baseball, but, yeah. but, but he, he is a kind of intellectual. Yeah. And, um, and um, Errol Morris did a very interesting documentary on... Um, uh, on Bannon, which nobody saw. It was a complete failure. It came and went. But it's actually, f and talk about giving the, be the devil his best lines. Errol Morris's technique is, is, to, is not to sort of argue with these people. And he doesn't with, with Bannon. He, he 
challenges him a little to, to sort of tell you, tell you more than Bannon maybe wants. But it's subtle. And I think too many people saw it as a kind of um, exoneration of, of Bannon. But Bannon uh, is very interesting in this respect on how he, uh, the techniques of the demagogue. And it's spending a lot of time running around Europe. Uh, yeah, I mean, inciting uh, demagoguery. Yeah. Where he's, he has a much more receptive audience. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, Morris made, made two films that are, are, are great. I don't know if the one on Bannon is great, but I think the one on uh, Donald Rumsfeld is really interesting. Yeah. And nobody saw that either. <laughs> Over here. Can you say which one that was? Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld, the oh, former Rumsfeld. Secretary yeah. of Defense. Yeah. Errol Morris said he was the most un-Jewish man he's ever met. <laughs> that he had no irony. Um, you went through a lot of characters already, uh, very interesting. Um, there's one character who is uh, keeping us very busy in Europe at the moment, uh, that's Vladimir Putin. So I'm interested in your view of him and, uh, I mean, also... Um, he produces a lot of uh, fake news or different truth or alternate effects or whatever you might call it. So I'm interested how you analyze his role. Well, I don't have anything terribly original to say about Putin, except that he's playing the same game, but with, with greater ruthlessness and also in a society that doesn't have enough... Um, uh, where the, the democratic institutions were never strong enough to, 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 to keep him in, um, to limit his, 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 his um, efforts. And so, but he's do doing this, what all demagogues do. I mean, he works on people's basest instincts. He works on their fears and their uh, sense of being surrounded by enemies, on, uh, that only he can keep you safe, give you pride, etc., etc. But um, so far, um, his success also seems to be a little limited. I mean, not the success on, 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 on holding on to power in Russia, um, but he um, uh, certainly hasn't convinced the rest of the world very well. I mean, he also plays the story of a lost empire. I'm sorry? You also place the story of uh, Lost Empire? Yeah. I mean, I think I, you could argue that, that the part of the success of Trump, um, certainly, in the case, certainly is true in the case of Hitler, is that what makes people um, receptive to demagoguery um, is the, 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 the fear and the sense of loss of status. And that can be class... It can be, in the case of the United States, where class and race overlap, it can be a bit of both. It can be national. And the mood in Germany after World War I, we don't need to elaborate. I mean, there was that cl a clear sense of the, a, a great people, what people felt was a great power, had been horribly humiliated. And you could say that, some, uh, that many supporters of Donald Trump in the United States feel the power of the U.S. slipping, the country that the world is always, whether they hated the U.S. or, or not, but was always looking up to as the, the greatest power and, 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 and they were richer, et cetera, et cetera, more powerful, greater in every respect. And after the Vietnam War, after the Iraq War and so on, there is a feeling that it's all slipping away. And... Um, Trump can certainly work on those kind of emotions. Uh, I would say Brexit and Boris Johnson in Britain in a much more minor way, because Britain is a minor power, but um, uh, is similar. That uh, It's interesting, for example, that in, in Britain, compared to the country I grew up in, or let alone Poland, the public mood was actually much less anti-German than the French were or the Dutch were or the Poles were. Um, uh, German, the Nazis were kind of amusing. So a television series made in Britain um, usually had you know, Nazis who were ridiculous and buffoons and they were funny in a way that a country that had been occupied by the Nazis couldn't make television series like that, LOLO and so on and so forth. And 
It began to change under Margaret Thatcher. Why did it begin to change? Because even the dumbest Brit began to finally realize that the Germans in particular were much better off than people in England. They were richer, they lived in bigger houses, they lived more comfortable lives, things worked and so on. Then the resentment began. We won the war. How come the enemies are living better than us? We, that's not fair. And that led to the Brexit attitude. Well, um, unfortunately, we have to bring it to an end, but I will do so on a note of sheer triumphalism at my uh, wisdom in creating the writer-in-residence uh, <laughs> category. And I want to thank you, Ian, uh, for a terrific discussion, which I'm sure we will continue momentarily uh, in the other room. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to just let you know about a few things that are coming up. Um, our next event will be an evening with the award-winning director and filmmaker, Julie Taymor. That will be Wednesday, um, and it will be, it's, everything is different, 6.30 p.m., and it will not be here, but at the uh, Universität der Kunste in Schöneberg, and we hope you will join us there. Um, much of the rest of the week will also be devoted, or the, the, even the following week will be devoted uh, to uh, showing Julie Taymor's films. Uh, uh, Titus, The Glorious, and Across the Universe, uh, which will be shown in cinemas uh, around Berlin on the 14th, 15th, and 16th. Have a look at our website, uh, AmericanAcademy.de, for exact times and locations. And our next event here will be uh, on May 11th, Thursday, at 7.30 p.m., with author Lori Moore, who's already in the front row, waiting to take the podium, uh, for uh, a, an event entitled A Father in Berlin, A Reading. So, uh, we look forward to seeing you again, and with that, I hope you'll give our speaker a hearty welcome. Hearty thank you.